Um, how many know worship's important? Amen? So we're going to kind of touch that topic a little bit, and uh, we'll probably stay on it for a few weeks because there's so much to be said in the Word of God concerning worship. There's a lot of Hebrew and Greek words we can break down uh, because um, we want to do things biblically. Amen? And so uh, I'm just going to open in prayer, and we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you for your Word today. We thank you, Lord, that it has the power to transform our hearts, has the power to change our minds, God. And Lord, we ask that you would come and transform us by your word. Let not one word return void. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So turn with me to Acts chapter 15, or look at the screen in front of you. And I want to talk about here a uh, first century conflict uh, in the church, first century church conflict. How many know churches have conflict sometimes? We don't like to, but they're there. And uh, I want to read about this conflict that was taking place and what transpired and how, how uh, we brought closure to that. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says, <clears throat> While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judah arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you're circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay? Um, I want to make a point here. Certain men came... Uh, to begin and teach, to teach the believers. I mean, you know, certain men will come, certain teachers will come, and if you're not careful, if you're not one who studies the word for yourself, you can easily be swayed into deception, okay? So it's so important that you guys go home and study the word and see if that which is being preached to you is correct. Amen? And, and so I want to challenge you to do that because uh, so many times we hear things and we have to check it with the word. Make sure it's in the proper context. And Paul and Barnabas uh, disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. So, you know, they were arguing. This was a big issue, okay? This was no small dissension. And so they had to, they had to come to a closure on this issue. So finally the church decided, and this is um, verse 2 still, uh, to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem accompanied by some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. So, so we, want to, we want this question answered, so we're going to send you to, to the headquarters, and you're going to ask this question. Um, verse 3, And the church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way at Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. And they told them much to everyone's joy that the Gentiles too were being converted. So all of these Gentiles were starting to get saved. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God was falling on the Gentiles as they did on the Jews in Jerusalem, and there was great joy in the city. Amen? Amen. Okay, so when they arrived at Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders, and they reported everything that God had done through them. And then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and in insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised, and uh, it's required to follow the law of Moses. And so there were believers from the sect of the Pharisees. How many know who the Pharisees were? We, we read about Jesus. He was going around, and he was getting all this trouble from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. who were always saying, Jesus, that's not the way we always did it. This is the way we've done it. These are our customs. This is, this is what the law of Moses And they were always a thorn in Jesus' side, constantly trying to bring their you know, doctrines of men into the, into the gospel. How many hear what I'm saying? And, and, and so here's these believers, say believers, who were once Pharisees. You don't have to say that, but that's okay. They were believers who, who were once Pharisees. Now they're, now they're believers in Jesus Christ, but how many know that they're still holding on to uh, their external worship? They, they still had things that they did to please God. And how many know in the New Covenant, it transitions from external worship to internal worship? God no longer looks at what we do for him as much as he looks at our heart and what we do. And so... There was religion coming in. These were believers that had a religious um, attitude. So let's look at what Paul and Barnabas said. They gave their testimony in Acts chapter 15, verse 6. And it says, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And then there had been much dispute. After much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know uh, that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the hearts, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. See, God knows the heart. 
And Peter's saying, God knows the hearts of men, and so he chose to give the Gentiles the Holy Spirit, even though they weren't following the customs that we followed, even though they weren't following the laws of Moses like we received. God looked at their hearts and said, here's a people who are hungry to worship me, and he poured out his Spirit upon the Gentiles. All right? And so... He made no distinction between us and them. This is verse 9. For he cleansed their hearts through faith. I want you to say this with me. He cleansed my heart heart through faith. faith. It's not by works. He made no distinction between us and them, the Jews and the Gentiles, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God? And this is very important. Peter is saying, when you try to put the law back on the Gentile church, what you're doing is you're challenging God. That's pretty pretty strong. Why are you challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we we are all saved the same way by understanding the, the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So why would you try to put that yoke or that burden of external practices to aim God's favor on the Gentiles? It's too much to bear. Is that really clear? All right. And so, verse 12, everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. You know, when God's moving by his spirit, miraculous signs and wonders take place. And they were laying that down as evidence, okay? Let's read on. Acts chapter 15, verse 13. And after that, the people became silent. James answered. Now, James was the leader in the church at the time, after he heard everyone. Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the word of the prophets agree, just as is written. Next verse, verse 16. After this, this is a prophetic word by Amos, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind, say the rest of mankind, may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord God who does all these things. And so God was saying here that he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David because he wants it to attract the rest of mankind. This gospel of the kingdom is not going to just be for the Jewish people anymore. It's because God sees the hearts of all mankind, and he wants to draw all people unto himself. So there's going to be a transition taking place here. And so I want to ask you this question. What is the tabernacle of David? We know that there were three temples in the Old Testament that housed the Ark of the Covenant. There was the tabernacle of Moses. Okay, there was the tabernacle of David, and then there was the temple of Solomon. And we understand that the Ark of the Covenant was a place that the glory of God was on the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim. How many know that? And so the Ark of the Covenant was actually kept in the Holy of Holies in the back of a temple, and there was a curtain that separated the people from their God. That's what the temple of Moses was. All right? And that first tabernacle, there was a veil. Say, there was a veil. Now, the purpose of that veil was to separate us from the glory of God, which is the kabod of God, the the very weighty presence of God, okay? And only the high priest could enter once a year for the sins of the people, right? And so the worship that took place in Moses' tabernacle was the sacrifice of animals. And listen, it was for the atonement of sin. So every time they worshiped, they would fall down and they would have reverence to God and they would, they would sacrifice animals for the atonement of their sins. Okay? And um, after David became the king, however, he made a controversial decision. He said, I'm going to move the Ark of the Covenant from this place and I'm going to set it up in a tent in Jerusalem. I'm going to take the Ark of the Covenant out of this place and I'm going to put it in a tent in Jerusalem and call it the Tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of Moses was still pitched at Gibeon. The sacrifices were still being carried out there by the priest, 
Okay? Moses' tabernacle still had the Holy of Holies in it, that room with the curtain, but there was something missing. It was the actual presence of God. The ark was taken out and put in a tent, but the temple was still there, and the priests were still doing their sacrifices. There was still atonement being made, but there was something missing in that tabernacle. What was it? It was the very glory of God. You know what? We're in a place today, even in the church world, where we can come together and we can go through the, with the, the, the rituals of sacrifice and praise, and, but the glory of God has departed. And David took the ark and moved it. David created a place that people could come, could worship joyfully without being separated from God by a veil. The tabernacle of Moses had a veil. The tabernacle of David, the veil was removed so people could see the Ark of the Covenant. They could worship God joyfully, not being separated from God. All right? And I want to say this. Remember that when the veil in the temple, the actual temple in Jerusalem, it was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died. It was torn because God's plan was always to have face-to-face worship with his people. He wants to be with his people. He doesn't want to be separated by the veil, but the veil was the flesh, and it was torn, and it was, separ- it was what was separating us from God. Amen? Amen. And so um, David understood something, that God wanted to have a relationship with his people. God didn't want a veil between us and, his, and him. He wanted us to have fellowship with God. And here's a verse in Isaiah chapter 16, 5 says, In mercy the throne will be established, okay? And one will sit on it in truth in the tabernacle of David. This is talking about Jesus prophetically. Jesus is going to sit in the tabernacle of David, and it's not the physical tabernacle, but it's symbolically speaking, judging and seeking justice and hasting righteousness. And so this is what's taking place. This is prophetically speaking, okay? And um, worship, instead of sacrifice of animals, that's, that, that's what was taking place at David's tabernacle. There were sacrifices, but it went deeper than that. There was sacrifices of praise. There were sacrifices of joy. There were sacrifices of thanksgiving because keep, people were not veiled anymore from the presence of God. Amen? Are you guys following me? Okay. Nobody falling asleep, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so, so let's look at this together, uh, talking about David's tabernacle. David's tabernacle was a place of praise and worship. And we're going to look at some verses here in Psalm chapter 95, verse 2. David writes here, Let us come before his presence. And so here's a tent. With, you just picture in your mind a tent, with, and you can see the Ark of the Covenant, and he's telling the people, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Let's shout unto the Lord. Let's worship before his presence. Let, let us be thankful to God. How many know God likes that? Right? We see in Psalm 100 verse 4, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Right? But Pastor Rick was here a few weeks ago and he talked about the importance of being thankful. How it, it, it breaks, it, there's a breakthrough in the spirit realm. When you begin to thank God, your breakthrough comes, amen? Your, your, your miracle comes. And so enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court, speaking of into that place right before the, you know, the presence of God, with thanksgiving, be thankful to him and bless his name. So can you see it in your mind? You see David calling the people, come on forward. I want you to be thankful and I want you to praise God. Psalm 1. 41 verse 2. Let's read it together. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. See, in in Moses' tabernacle, they were doing all of this. They had the burning incense before the throne. They had had the evening sacrifice. And David was saying, listen, we're going to take it a step farther. It's going to be actually my prayer that's coming up as incense. I'm going to lift my hands before you as the evening sacrifice because God is after the heart, not just the exercise. Amen? So the worship that took place at David's tabernacle was different than Moses' sacrifice. Because at Moses' temple, the sacrifices were animal sacrifices. At David's, it was a sacrifice of praise unto God. Amen? 
In Psalm 27, verse 6, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Let's read this together. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. So David was just like totally like into worshiping and praising and shouting because God likes it. Amen? The next thing they did here, so they made a sacrifice of praise. Um, and then number two, they clapped their hands. So they clapped their hands. And I like that even Don this morning said, let's everyone clap our hands, right, at the beginning. That's powerful because they did that as a form of worship. In Psalm 47, verse 1, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. So I want us all to say it together. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. All right, so there's something about shouting there's something that when we shout, there's breakthrough, right? When we clap our hands, we're, we're thanking God even for the areas where we still need him to show up. Like we're thanking him ahead of time for his goodness. It sets you up for good things, amen? And so they clapped their hands. Next, um, they lifted their hands in worship. So before, just picture in your mind this tent with the ark, and the people are all lifting their hands in worship. So many churches have a problem with lifting of hands. I think it's kind of spooky, but it's biblical worship. This is biblical worship. It's Davidic worship. Why? Because, as we were reading in Acts chapter 15, the Lord is rebuilding the tabernacle of David to be a drawing card for the world. To see people worshiping God. To see people entering into a connected relationship with God. Some of you know we had a Chinese student come and stay with us while we were, he was going to school, an internship. And he, was an, he came an atheist, left an agnostic, so that's one step. It was good. <laughs> but he told me we were driving home from church one day, and he says, you know, when you guys are doing the singing of the hymns that you do, he goes, it's like you're singing love songs to God. And I said, bang on. This is about relationship, right? It's about intimacy with God. In Psalm 134, they lifted their hands, it says, a song, uh, Praise the Lord in his house at night, a song of ascents, a song of ascents, sorry. <laughs> Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord. All night prayer meetings, here we go. All you servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. This is biblical worship. It's a, it's a sign of surrender, lifting up holy hands. Amen? And so they lifted up their hands in worship. Another thing they did was they shouted. Say, shout. shout. All right. Shouting is very important. Psalm 47, verse 5. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout or the sound of a trumpet. Amen? So, you know, church can be loud. You know, you know, there should be shouting, there should be dancing, there should be singing, there should be all of this stuff going on. Why? Because we're celebrating the goodness of our God's presence in front of us. Now listen, if God's presence is not in the house, if the glory of God is not in the house, I can understand you sitting there like you just drank lemon juice. But when God's presence is in the house, guys, you, you know, you, you know, your knees should be having fellowship one with another. Like, oh, yeah. You know, like, there should be some excitement. There should be something going on. There should be some dancing. There should be some twirling. There should be some shouting. Amen? Why? Because God's presence is in the house. Amen? And so that word shout, when I looked it up in the, in the Hebrew, is uh, toroah. It probably sounds different in Hebrew. It means clamor. There should be clamor in the house of God because of the presence of God. Okay? It, that is acclamation of joy. There should be a battle cry in the house of God. This is what this word means. Especially the, the, the clamor of the trumpets, okay? There should be alarms blowing. There should be trumpets. There should be joy. There should be loud noise, rejoicing, shouting, joyful sounds. Sounds like a hockey game. Doesn't it? It's amazing. I've, seen, I've gone to hockey games. I'm not going to, you know, you wouldn't know these people. Christians, and they're like, ah! going nuts yeah you know they're dancing they're standing on the seats and and they come to church and they're like blessed assurance jesus is mine 
and they're doing this. It's like, man, get into it. Man, you need to be stirred up and honor your God. That doesn't mean you have to jump around if you don't want to. But don't be shut to anybody else doing it because that's key to what God is doing. Okay, the next one is they danced. Say they danced. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 16, let's read it together. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. She despised him in her heart. And I've seen that so many times where there's a move of God in a church or in a certain movement where people are excited about God. And other believers sit there and they despise it in their heart. Like, oh, they're emotional. That's emotionalism. And, you know, that's not reverence for the Lord. They need to come back to the temple of uh, Moses and lay down. And... Where'd that veil go? Where's the reverence of God? They put the veil back. And they, they, they despise uh, they despise the move of God. They despise biblical worship because they don't understand it. And, and it's foreign to them. And so they despise it. And Micah did that. She, she, she despised David. You're supposed to be a king and you're dancing foolishly in the fruit of the loom. Like, come on. We're okay with wild dancing, but not in your underwear. He did it in his underwear. She despised him in her heart. And the Bible says because she despised him in her heart, she could not have any more children. And that's what's happening in churches that despise the moving of the Holy Spirit and biblical worship and dancing and celebration. If they despise it, what happens is the churches start to die. No more people get saved. And, and, and next thing you know, you go to the church. Everybody there is in their 80s and 90s. And I mean, it's just like it's dying. How many hear what I'm saying? But we got some 80s and 90s in here that know how to praise and worship God. So that's, that's the key, right? So. So. Anyway, so let's move on. So they dance. Psalm 149, verse 3. Let, let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and the harp. That word dance is kara, which actually means to whirl, to whirl around. So. You know, uh, who was it who was sitting up here this morning? Uh, was it Brooke? When she was whirling around, she was the most biblical person in here. That's what it means. It means to whirl around, you know? Uh, so we should all whirl after. We're going to do a whirl. We'll have a whirl party after. We'll whirl around, right? Um, <laughs> so, there's a, so, so there's this expression of dance that we're supposed to have, okay? And the next one is they sought the Lord. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 10 to 11. It reminds you that all this happened in front of the tent of David. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who rejoice, uh, who seek the Lord. Uh, seek the Lord and his strength and seek his face forevermore. So there was a time of seeking and waiting on the Lord, waiting on his direction. So there's, there's also times of silence in the presence of the Lord. Amen. But they were waiting before the presence of God. And then the last one is they played their instruments. They played their instruments. And for a long time in the church, through the dark ages, even into the last, you know, 100 years or so, they were debating, is it wrong to play the organ in church? You know, should we really have strings in church, you know, because it's, it's not reverential. And they were kind of against it. But the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 5, that David had 4,000 were gatekeepers in front of the tent. 4,000 praised the Lord with musical instruments. I think you would think, like, that would give you license. Hey, 4,000 musicians, I think we can have one organ player, okay? I mean, 4,000 people were playing instruments. I would have loved to hear the sound of that. Could you imagine? I mean, obviously, they weren't all doing it at once, but there was probably a whole team of people worshiping God, praising God, okay? And I love this. David throws in his little conceit there. He goes, yeah, which I made, by the way. I made, I made all the instruments, 4,000, you know, because I'm good, right? Uh, with the purpose of giving praise, so David made all these instruments so that people could praise God, okay? And this was the expression of worship from David's tabernacle, okay? Um, and then David also wrote, and I know there's a lot of scripture, but we're going through the word together. David also spoke, uh, spoke several times about the Gentiles coming into the kingdom, uh, and he was excited about that. So in Psalm 117, it says, praise the Lord, all you nations. Say, all you nations. All you nations. Say, that includes me. 
Praise him, all you people of the earth, for his, unlove, his unfailing love for, uh, for us is powerful. Okay, for the Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Psalm 47, 8 to 9. God reigns above the nations, sitting on his holy throne. The rulers of the world have gathered together, okay, with the people of God, the God of Abraham, for the kings of the earth belong to God. Amen? He is highly on, he's highly honored. Say, he's highly honored. Everywhere. So this is a picture that David's getting. There's going to be a time where God's not just moving in, in, in Jerusalem, in this area. It's going to be everywhere. God is going to have control of this thing, okay? So what happens then is there's this, this tent thing going on. David's got the tent set up, okay? And people are coming to worship, and they're waiting for his son Solomon to build the temple that is going to house the, the Ark of the Covenant. So finally the temple is completed, and after it's completed... The, the ark has moved back into the Holy of Holies, and as soon as it is, the glory of the Lord falls. You can read about it in Second Chronicles 5.14. The glory of the Lord falls, and no one can stand in the presence of God because now the ark has its setting place, okay? But here's something that's very interesting, that less than 200 years later, Amos, the prophet Amos, starts prophesying about the restoration of David's tabernacle. He's not talking about the restoration of Moses' tabernacle. But he's talking about the restoration of David's tabernacle. Why? Because the purpose of Moses' tabernacle, again, uh, uh, showed that the, there was perfection that was needed to come before the presence of God. There was perfection, say perfection, that was needed to come before the presence of God. But David knew that there would be uh, atonement that was going to come into place. And... Um, and it actually says, the Bible says that you couldn't come before the tabernacle if you had sin in your life, if you were illegitimate, all right? And many scholars believe that David was illegitimate. He was born. There were some issues around his birth. How many hear what I'm saying? He was the seventh child. And when Samuel the prophet came and said, bring out all your sons, Jesse, they were all trembling because they, they, they feared the man of God. And he brought everyone, but he didn't bring David. David was left in the field. So I'm doing some study from, from Jew, uh, Jewish texts, and there was some, some talk about David being illegitimate. Jesse was his father, but there was some stuff that was happening. So there, there's that question. I don't know. We don't know for sure. There's a debate about that. But I will say this. In Deuteronomy... Um, or Psalm chapter 51, verse 5, David said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Okay? And, and, and the tabernacle of David portrayed the mercy of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 2, it said that you could not, if you were illegitimate, if you were born outside of marriage or there was sexual sin, you were born, you were considered illegitimate, and you couldn't go before the temple of Moses. So if David, if this was the case, David says, you know what, I'm, I might be illegitimate to go before the temple, but you know what, God anointed me with his spirit when Samuel came. He poured the oil upon me, and I'm, I know that God has accepted me, so I'll just take, because I want to honor the word, so I'll just take the Ark of the Covenant out of Moses' temple, and I'll set up my own. And I'll come before it and I'll worship him because I'm no longer illegitimate. I am sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Amen. You hear what I'm saying this morning? So if you say, hey, I'm illegitimate, you know, I, my, there's, there's controversy around how I was born or there's controversy. So the tabernacle of David portrayed the mercy of God, giving all equal free access to God's presence. Everybody could come. Because why? Sin is taken care of at the cross. And remember, Jesus is going to sit in, as, on the throne in the tabernacle of David with open arms. Okay? As David was moving the ark to Jerusalem, there was an accident. How many remember the accident? That it actually scared David. He was upset, but then he got scared. And it's in 2 Samuel 6, verse 6 to 15. For time's sake, we're not going to read it. But Uzziah... The priest was walking, and, and as they were carrying, they're carrying the ark, it almost fell over, and Uzziah tried to catch it, and he was struck dead for touching the glory of God. Do you guys remember the story? He was struck dead. So David, David was really scared. So what he did was he left the ark with Obed-Edom for three months. So he left it with this guy who was a Gentile, say Gentile. So he wasn't a Jewish guy. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his household for three months. So the whole time that the ark was at this Gentile's house, 
His family prospered. His finances prospered. Everything prospered. Why? Because wherever God's glory is, there's prosperity. And David understood that. So he came before God and he worshiped and he shouted because he knows wherever I honor the glory of God, prosperity will come and blessing will come into my life. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, say all these things, will be added unto you. So there's always prosperity when you honor the, the glory of God. 